Good morning. Uh, I have a question for you. Do you believe the customer is always right? Today, we're going to find out if this myth is true. Stick around. I'll be back with Dominic Stoddard, who is going to give us insight to our rights and responsibilities as customers in Trinidad and Tobago. We'll be right back. Your strategy has to involve your mindset and your strategy then involves the actions that you take to move you from where you are to where you want to be. I'll start with what Visa isn't, right? Visa doesn't issue credit card. We don't issue credit. So Visa doesn't do that, uh, which surprises a lot of people. Use a phrase like, well, you know, things changed, but things don't change. People change things. All the legislation that has been passed, somebody advocated for that. And so International Women's Day is to commemorate that history of women making change. Several of the banks have started to migrate their existing debit card portfolio to chip and pin EMV technology. So the SMEs are going to benefit from a wide range of customers who previously did not have a credit card, but only had a debit card. Good morning and welcome to the live series Straight Off The Bat, a show that covers the need to revive, survive and adapt to the new normal of COVID-19. Join us on Thursdays as we speak to individuals across multiple industries who will help you understand financial literacy and education. If you're joining us on Facebook, um, just, you know, I'll wait for you for a second. Just click that follow button. Thank you so much. And follow our page to continue seeing content that will help you manage your money. Today, we're discussing knowing and understanding your customer rights and responsibilities in Trinidad and Tobago, which is such a timely matter. I think this show today is more for my knowledge than you, because I have so many questions for our guest, who is Dominic Stoddard, the financial services ombudsman of Trinidad and Tobago. Now, I have questions about that word, and I'm probably going to stumble on that word multiple times, but that's okay. We have the guest for it. He is the financial services ombudsman of the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago. So literally, we're coming out of the goat's mouth. He's also the head of the National Financial Literacy Program and chairman of the National Financial Education Committee, responsible for the development and execution of the National Financial Education Strategy. He's a trained mediator and a financial advisor certified by the Institute of Banking and Finance of Trinidad Tobago, and he holds a BSc in Economics from the University of the West Indies and an MSc in Development Statistics from Sir Arthur Lewis Institute of Social and Economic Studies. He's also, I don't know where he gets any time, but he's also pursuing an MBA in Business Intelligence and Data Analytics at the Arthur Lockjack Global School of Business. And somewhere in between all of that, He's an avid viewer of the hit crime thriller series, The Blacklist. So we have so much to unpack but with Dominic today. So let's just welcome Dominic. For those who don't know what it is, um, uh, a.k.a. me, what is an ombudsman? Let's start from the ground up. Okay. The word ombudsman is a Nordic word. Somewhere in the Scandinavian countries, when they started to formalize their government systems and uh, interact with uh, individuals and citizens as um, service providers, there were problems being encountered along the way where individuals would have felt that they were unfairly treated. So the word ombuds or ombudsman really means at its core, roughly translated as your representative someone who will stand in on your behalf to go up against large agencies which you believe you don't have the power to interact with in an equally dynamic way. But that was like my first experience with, with money. Very, very first experience. I've been in banking since I was a teenager. scope of influence is very specific. I operate within the confines of those agencies that are supervised by the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago. Those institutions are commercial bank, trust and mortgage finance companies, 
finance houses and merchant banks and insurance companies any one of the institutions that require a central bank license to operate there is where i'm able to make interventions after the appropriate steps have been taken by a customer who feels dissatisfied now that's very specific the consumer affairs division has broad scope and latitude with respect to purchasing and transaction and so on so i'm mostly confined into the financial sector so let's talk about that because uh in introducing you we spoke about your role as the financial services ombudsman what does that entail what's your role there my role is to receive complaints from customers who are not satisfied with their financial service providers and i'm talking specifically about those licensed by the central bank okay your your commercial bank trust and mortgage and finance house or your insurance company for example each institution is required to have an internal complaints process so you go to the institution to do a transaction and for whatever reason things go awry and you are not satisfied your first um the step the first step required of you is to complain at the bank or branch in which you conducted the transaction and it's always preferable to do so in writing if you are not satisfied with the bank or branch and you wish to access the institution's internal complaints process it's usually located at the head office now i'm not sure how relevant that is anymore because a lot of us are doing things by email but even if you email a customer care email address or whoever addresses these things for customers you are required to have proper details and records so that you can provide any kind of documentation to say i did provide copies of this i was asked to sign this i was asked to pay this i did all of that and still i i didn't get what i was uh, bargaining for and if that the the institution is unable to provide you with a satisfactory response within two months time you come to the office of the financial services ombudsman located on the first floor of the central bank's building and you lodge a formal complaint otherwise you can go online at our website at ofso.org.tt and you will access a formal um, a, a short form to lodge a complaint so we know that you have an issue all right so you could approach us online or you can come in person but you must give the institution sufficient time to really address the complaint that you lodged based on what you're saying we have to make sure and have a trail a paper trail as well as um giving it some time because you have to showcase that you've made an effort you've made an attempt to get this problem solved but it's not being solved so now it comes to you is that the case yes but did that time lapses for two reasons one is you you would have interacted with them and build up a certain amount of correspondence they would have asked you for things and you would have provided so that may take you know maybe a few days a few weeks what have you but also depending on the nature of the complaint so for example if you have an let's say an identity theft situation where your credit card is compromised and people may be doing transactions using your information you have to give the institution enough time to do a proper investigation and a proper investigation could sometimes take six weeks you know because there, you wouldn't be the only complaint in the queue and now that time needs to be reduced as far as possible now that we're in digital age but more than that sometimes they actually have sophisticated machine learning models that they run against data for your your history your data history and also against the history other other people's data to make a a, a reasonably accurate 
determination as to whether you were really a victim of financial fraud or whether you are in fact um attempting to do something that might really be legal or you know a kind of scam or so From the customer's perspective, you know, what are some of the challenges being faced by that individual? You know, because if you don't understand your rights and responsibilities, what are some of the pitfalls that we fall into? They, they think about consumer rights, but to a large extent, it, it overlaps heavily with the responsibilities of a consumer whether it be a financial or general consumer you have a responsibility to understand firstly what your true needs are you may go to a bank to open an account or you may be doing your research online but you have to you have to be clear in your mind what's the purpose of this account and once you clarify what your needs are you're better able to decide on which product suits you best the second responsibility you have is to understand what is being offered to you because you may go and you may speak to someone and they are custom marketing things generally they say well no you may not need a premium account you just need a basic savings understand what you're signing up for uh, even your credit card and so on remember we spoke about customers having choice and the ability to shop around well it's the same thing you go to one institution and these are the terms you go to another institution they have different terms some of them at the margin you know they try a little product differentiation but what it's all about is customers understanding the different products that are on offer and choosing wisely making responsible financial decisions about how they spend how they save whether they budget what they're preparing for whether they understand and are able to compare between some of these these products that's the most empowering thing that an individual can do for themselves in building a history of responsible financial behavior and our national financial literacy program in fact deals with the knowledge the skills the attitudes and the behaviors that you need in order to make prudent financial decisions so that over time you can enjoy the quality of life that you would like to we we have a lot of resources on the website that provides information for young people for potential homeowners for people planning for retirement for people who want to understand budgeting saving investing looking at a financial calculator making choices between mortgages you know just a variety of useful resources and some videos that helps provide basic financial literacy information for anyone who is interested and all our programs and offerings are free of charge the second thing is that there's a part on our website where you could click request a session and if you could get 25 or 30 people together we will provide you with a skilled financial literacy tutor to take you through either one or two sessions or maybe if you want to discuss a series of se sessions again all free of charge once you follow the instructions about requesting a, a session from us what we do is we have one of our officers contact you to do a needs assessment we want to make sure that we understand what your needs are because some people have problems with budgeting and saving some they're good at budgeting and saving but they don't really understand and they probably are afraid of investing we want to help individuals to develop just what i said before the knowledge the skill the behaviors 
and the attitudes to manage money properly and those things give you one other thing confidence to ask the correct questions of your financial service providers in order to ensure that you get the best deals or you choose the most appro appropriate products for yourself so we we also would have been doing a lot of um, expositions and fairs what we've essentially done is we've divided the population into segments so we have primary and secondary school children constituting one se segment we have faith-based organizations we have government and related agencies we have at-risk youths so we have a number of different agencies that we run continuous programs with and we also entertain requests from the general public you have a church group you have a, a sports club you have anything where people interact with money and you want us to do a session we we, we well we would have ordinarily gone to you to do it community centers what have you but now we do all of our sessions virtually online and we send you the link you don't have to worry about that you just clarify your needs what your needs are It doesn't come by automatically it comes from a certain series of consistent examples by parents to children so when you get your 100 or one 200 dollars from your grandparents for your birthday of course you can spend one when you go to the mall but you have this steady practice that you have to save one you have to put it you know wherever you want to save it at home or in a financial institution and over time just helping children with that example or sometimes we think children are too young to involve in finance to be involved in financial discussions and to get them um, ready and prepared as early as possible in life you need to take them to the supermarket with you and let them see that you're watching different products and you're comparing prices and you're looking at the size and you're thinking about what might waste if you buy a large versus a small or what is more economical to buy in a pack of six or a dozen versus you know one or two and that kind of thing it's never too early to get children involved in financial matters you mentioned earlier that there are these free um uh I guess events and learning processes as long as you have 20 plus people which i understand um and within those groups are at risk and a lot of times we have this perception that all you need to do is work hard and you'll get to where you need to go but i, I really want to understand the difference between financial inclusion and literacy if you could educate us on that all right F financial literacy is possessing the skill to make a, appropriate financial choices so you you have knowledge of things like budgeting saving investing debt management uh, risk protection and those kinds of things but not just knowing them but you actually have the skill that is required to apply some of these things all right so financial literacy which derives from financial education really is about having the skill to do certain things financially the knowledge and the skills financial inclusion on the other hand is having the knowledge of and making actual use of financial products and services in a sustainable way a lot of people for example see themselves as excluded from the financial system because they may have been they may be required to have two forms of id and because they they had only one they were unable to open a savings account or they have an account they have a small business but they find it very difficult to access loan facilities that will help their business grow and develop and many times it's because they they may not fully understand um 
things like proper record keeping and cash flow management and that kind of thing but a financially included person or financial inclusion really refers to access to and use of financial products and services so you're excluded if you do not have access whether it is for an account of a particular type or insurance policy of a particular type or able to make use of a credit card of a particular type it is access to these these products and services and actually making use of because some people they may have access to and again they may have had a bad experience and they decided I don't want to do insurance anymore. These people, they don't like to pay. Or they mean say, um, the the banks, you know, you hear this all the time, that the banks applying so many fees, they left thousands of dollars there, and when they check back, however many months or, or whatever after, they saw that the money uh, went down and down and down, and they don't understand some basic things. For example, I hold no brief for banks, but I just want to explain to the listeners and the public at large. When you pay how much ever for uh, account maintenance fees at a bank, you're not paying the bank to keep your money. What you're paying the bank for is the entire infrastructure of support that surrounds your account. So you can check on your phone check your balance you can go online and check your balance you could get text messages when money hit your account you could transfer account from one person to another person either within your bank or in the next bank you can make online payments of bills you can do so many things those things and also your money needs to be secure it must be secured in a way that nobody must be able to come and you know just say uh, interfere with it so to provide you with the security the protection to provide you with all the supporting services where you can constantly check and get updated account balance you can see when checks and transfers go outward or hit your account inbound these things cost money so it's not like you're paying a bank to keep your money and that kind of thing and the other thing is banks report uh profits from time to time quarterly biannually wholly and what have you and a lot of people might say oh my goodness all of this money they're making almost a billion dollars or something like that you know if you simply take the profit and i'm not saying that they're not profitable but i'm just saying if you take the profit and you divide it by the capital that the bank has invested the, and you scale it in reference to that what you were thinking before about the amount that they're making you get a, a totally different and far more reasonable picture and i will also hasten to add that it would be far worse for all for a lot if not all of us if we had a set of weak banks in the country where an institution was going under every so often and then because of interconnectedness they're bringing down others with them and the, the financial system is unstable and unsecure but it's not always easy to have this conversation with the public because what they are seeing and their interpretation sometimes is far different from reality but they won't get that information anywhere and they also have very emotive feelings that if they were to take a, a dispassionate look at some things they'll come with different very conclusions Yeah, I, I really feel this session is making me more, my eyes open to to what my responsibility is. And I, I too, going to be honest and transparent, complain about, you know, the idea of the, the, the monthly payment coming off the banks. But I had the experience of opening a bank account in New York. And let me tell you, there is absolutely 
no interest in nothing new york's um interest rate is insane the process and the fees are insane you know and i know you're in uh you know the us dollars but in comparison i was just like you know what guys just take come back to trinidad just take my money it's fine it's fine it's not it's not as bad as new york continue taking my money it's okay <laughs> You really don't understand until you experience, uh, you know, uh, different options, what exactly is happening. And I think you did a great job of explaining what those fees are for as well. Yes. And we have a lot of um, very specialized facilitators. Like when people uh, make an inbound request for the services of the National Financial Literacy Program, we actually have people who specialize in debt management you know sometimes people over time find themselves in debt and they can't see their way out of it or so we have experts in that we also have people who specialize in home ownership we've recently beefed up our uh, capacity to do sessions on entrepreneurship because we understand that the economy has been in several years of decline and because of that some people the pandemic will be um either working reduced hours or not working at all but ma many times you know these people have skills that they they haven't yet put to the proper use and what we're trying to do is to shift the mindset from looking for a job writing a resume and start to now consider what are my available skills and which of them can i monetize and what do i need to do to start and where do i go for the information on how to register my business and how do i plan for my cash flow management and how do i price my products for profitability and competitiveness who are my who is my strategic competition you know things like that where do i access funding what do I require in order to have proper record keeping to access some of these services? These are the kinds of things that we are trying to, to work with the public at large and offer these services absolutely free. And we encourage anyone hearing about it to come and make full use of these services. The opportunity to be educated with the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago with the, uh, if you have 20 plus people, you can come and teach you know what you need to do you also mentioned debt learning about debt which is something i wish i had as a younger person because you get your first credit card and you're like this is money but it's actually not your money um so if you don't have 20 plus people and you still want to learn what do you do i think um you have to introspect if you i think you should actually try to use the services and get proper advice from uh, an unbiased source such as our program but if you're unable to start off with some basic thing personal financial discipline and i'll just give you two tips one is oftentimes we go to places stores supermarkets what have you and we just buy whatever we need because at the point in time you have the available cash to buy sometimes you're not even looking at what your total coming up to unless it's a, a significant amount but small amounts many occasions they add up to big amounts so what we find a lot of people have a vague idea in their head about how much money they'll save and how much they'll spend and how but you have to be very specific about budgeting you set a limit on what you will spend during any given month. And if you could hold on that with a little bit of a con uh, contingency, having that financial discipline to do your budget helps you to do something else, which is to save. Because you, you've started out knowing how much you're going to spend and how much you're going to save. And you're going to do your best to stick to that as far as possible. Some people will say, but I'm not even making enough money to save. I'm not making enough money to get by. And a lot of times it's because of the lack of discipline. And the second point that a lot of us don't think about is wastage, household wastage. You buy a lot of things that you think you might need, but you do not actually need and they sometimes stay around so long especially like food items i don't know how it happens 
you meet the expiry date and it's no longer good you just have to throw that out or you buy something one day you buy whatever you just bought more than you actually needed at the time and then a lot of it is going to be thrown away and the third thing in that wastage is a lot of us accumulate stuff because they sell us all kinds of gadgets and marketing you have a good proper charger for your cell phone but you don't want to use your charger anymore you want to rest it on one of the charging bays the two items have the same basic function but they are priced differently why do you want one just because it's a more updated way of charging your phone the phones how often do you really need to update you know basic things like that so the the first is if you're not seeking help introspect and start off by budgeting start off by saving start off by minimizing wastage start off by having the discipline to not acquire some things that we think we need that we don't actually do so we're properly distinguishing between wants and needs and the third thing is not acquiring bad debt bad debt is debt for consumer items where it generates no real income now the acquisition of a motor vehicle in times where you need personal safety for you and those you love might justify acquisition all right so i mean i'm not drawing a hard and fast line but i'm saying some people incur debt for things like studies for starting small business for acquisition of a mortgage for you know things that in general will either grow in value over time or it will generate some kind of income supplemental income passive or otherwise that will help them so you include that to purchase shares that's not a bad thing yeah and the word debt you know it's something that i am learning that doesn't necessarily has to be this negative thing because it's an understanding of money and i think you know you've given me so much to think about and it's it's something that we definitely should explore further thanks a lot for joining us today dominic um kevin and desiree all up in the comments agreeing as well <laughs> desiree said she's guilty of the shoe situation and purchasing marketing gets us all so we just have to be aware of it <laughs> we all have our things okay we all have our things so you're going to close off now. Thanks again to Dominic Stoddard for joining us today and sharing insight into knowing your customer rights and responsibilities in Trinidad Tobago. Be sure to check out the links in the comment section and sign in to sign up to be notified. <laughs>